And I'm actually going to get right into it. And you really want to know how. You know, how can I blaze my own path? Uh, how can I be successful? Um, how can I follow the path that someone else has laid for me to be successful? Me to be successful. Me to be successful. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 218, season 2, episode 18 of Campus Cuts. Today, I got a special guest. I got a guest that has been um, under the rock, under a rock, been <laughs> chilling in the cut, been like, <laughs> he's been, he's been ghost. And he's, this is a rare appearance for the man. Um, he used to be a huge socialite back in the day. And now he is the mentor. I've, um, to me, he reminds me of Kakashi. Uh, he is <laughs> my highest. <laughs> he used to be at my lowest. <laughs> he's, he's still in the in the Um, he is. Uh, he's a good brother of the AFIA. Um, he crossed the same year as I did. Um, we crossed together, but also, um, more than that, he's a brother of Christ, and he's a disciple, and he's a leader. He's a mentor, and he's somebody that um that is always talking about, always talking about empowerment, and has always stepped out of his comfort zone to be able to reach people and live out the way that Christ has said. And not by just saying being complicit, but actually standing with the injustices, advocating for people that can't speak to for themselves and making sure that he's doing that, doing that in his daily walk. So um, nonetheless, I wanna welcome my man, my big brother, Jamarcus Ransom. Welcome to the show, bro. What's up, man, what's up? Hey, I'm finally here. After he's a while, I'm finally he's there. here. He finally made it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old. Yeah, he, getting old, so I gotta conserve that energy. Yeah, man. How old are you, bro? You like what? Twenty, twenty. Twenty-four, bro. I ain't even that old. See, I'm about to turn twenty-four. Not say that he's old, <laughs> twenty-four. But he, I mean, you've always had an old spirit. You've always had an old soul. Yeah, feel it in my soul, man. Feel it in my soul. I didn't know um, you were actually. Alyssa's actually older than you, <laughs> but she graduated yeah. after you. Yep. Yeah. She, uh, I think she's a whole, almost a whole year older than me. She's 25. She turned 25 a couple, like a month, no, three weeks ago. I was on the phone with her. Shout out Alyssa. Oh, she, she barely older than me, man. She like a few months older than me. So don't, hey, Alyssa, don't hear this and let it get to your head. She's a few months older than me. <laughs> <laughs> man. Can't let her, yeah. Dude, this has been in the works for months. I'm so glad that we were able to finally get it. You would cancel on me each time. <laughs> Well, no. Hey, I'm here. I'm here now, bro. I'm here now. I look, y'all, everybody that's hearing this, if you know me, y'all know I'm something else on my phone. So, hey, we here now. That's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, man. So, bro, it's um, it's so it's so crazy because not only it's not even just for the episode's sake, but I mean, we have a close relationship regardless, and it's not even um. It's not even the relationship where like we have to call each other every day, but I know we're just picking up right after we left off. We're continuing it. I always go to you for prayer, about discipleship. Yes, sir. Everything. So, um, I mean, I'm glad it's just going to be us talking. Like that was the whole point. You know, the concept of campus cuts. It's a multi generational, multicultural show that um, brings people to the barber shop. But obviously, we're in the closet. <laughs> I'm in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> but it was inspired by the shop by LeBron James. Um, and how he was able to have different people and different perspectives just to talk about the industry and just talk about life and um, society and culture. It really is just a take on society and culture. And I really feel like that's um, becoming more prevalent day by day as we continue to live in 2020. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> Most definitely. Every day, we're reminded more and more of the society that we are a part of. Man, it is crazy. But I mean, of course, there's only so much I can, I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, introduce yourself. Um, usually I ask um, guests because they're usually college age students or they're doing something. Um, what is your name, your, your profession, <laughs> um, or what you graduated with um, in undergrad, where you go to school, and uh, yeah, your hometown. Yeah, uh, so name, obviously, Jamarcus Ransom. Uh, I'm from College Station, Texas. Graduated from Baylor. I graduated 2017, studied business. And I've stuck around Waco since then, so uh, familiar with a lot of Baylor, a lot of Waco. Uh, and now I work at Baylor in admissions, so I've been around for a little while. Uh, we'll just say, long time Baylor person. Proud. <laughs> we'll say I'm a proud Baylor alum today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> today we'll say I'm a proud Baylor alum. Today a proud Baylor alum. Man, um, you've been here. 
So technically, you have been here since 2013. Yes, sir. Well, you've been in Waco from 2013. Now it's 2020. Seven years, bro. Yeah, it's been a minute, minute, bro. <laughs> it's been a minute, bro. I need to, I need to hit the road. I'm counting down the days, to be honest. Okay. Well, I'm saying that, but then I stay a year longer. So eventually, <laughs> I'm gonna leave. I just gotta actually do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, are you planning on leaving Waco anytime soon? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking like within the next two years, maybe. Uh, I want to go to school. I really don't know what I want to do yet, uh, which I feel like normally when we say we don't know what we want to do, we get stressed out. But I'm realizing, like, I just got to wait and figure it out. Like, as long as I'm around people, I'm making an impact where I am good. So as soon as I figure out what I want to do, whether that's going to school, whether that's getting a job, I definitely want to leave Waco. Definitely want to leave Texas. Uh, don't know where I want to go. Don't know when that's going to be. 2020 is not the time to be moving. So I'm not moving right now. <laughs> but Eventually, I'm gonna move. So yeah, I'm figuring it out. Yeah. That okay, okay. Because there was at one point in time that you did get accepted into the school, um, the master, um, the master's program of social work. And, yeah. Um, so whatever happened with that, bro? Yeah. Good question. So uh, after I graduated, I worked for a year at Baylor. So I worked in the provost's office. I did. I was a special assistant to the provost. So I did a lot of different stuff. Uh, like research, I helped with a leadership class, uh, the leadership class that Dr. Jackson teaches at Baylor. And during that year, I applied to grad school, got accepted to Baylor School of Social Work. I was like pretty sure I was going to go. Um, I mean, it was the best setup I could have, full ride. Um, I had a paid internship. And around that same time, I got asked to uh, take another job um, at a local church. And I was going to try to make <laughs> both work, uh, but really felt at the time. Like, I should follow the calling that I thought I might have in ministry. Um, and so I put, school, I put school on hold, basically. I deferred a year. Put it on hold um, and went and worked at a church and definitely learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot working at a church. Uh, but I was so tired. Like, afterwards, I was in a, wasn't in the healthiest place in a lot of ways after working there. Um, not specifically because of the church, but like a number of factors. Yeah. Uh, and so I wasn't in the right state of mind to go to school. And financially, I wasn't in the best place to go straight to grad school. So uh, came back and started working at Baylor, uh, which has been good. This year has been like better than I could have expected. So really? yeah, that's what happened. I'm Technically, I guess they probably dropped my deferral now, but still deferred. I mean, hey. But it's okay. That's that's cool though. But like, really? So I mean, you have seen Baylor change a lot. I remember like the very first uh, guest I had was Kev, and he was talking about all like yeah. the Baylor days and how it used to be light, it lit and live and everything. Um, I mean, honestly, I don't even want this conversation to be about Baylor because I'm actually honestly tired of the school at this point. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. Like life is Bro, more the than semester cool. is over. The semester like, let, is over. Yeah, uh, let Baylor go. But uh. I mean, but it's in the sense of how now I think this is going to be the last time I'm going to ask about Baylor, but um, what, like, how have you feel like Baylor has changed since you've been here or how Baylor yeah. has changed and like, what has that <clears throat> been as a black man in America for sure? Yeah, uh, man. Oh, that's a tough question. I know. I feel like <laughs> Baylor has changed in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, Baylor is still Baylor. Okay. Uh, and the reason I say that is because for me, when I was at Baylor, something that as far as being a black man at Baylor, something that stood out was how connected the black community was. Um, and that I think that's out of necessity. There, there are black people at Baylor, but not a lot. Uh, and the way that I think a lot of us uh, made it at Baylor, and for me, I didn't really get connected with black Baylor until I was a junior, but the way a lot of people make it is they get connected. Uh, to Black Baylor. So I think that's something that's still pretty common. Um, I feel like there were some very prominent leaders on campus when I got to Baylor um, that let out in like social events. They let it, they were, they were the face of everything. Uh, so obviously with changing the leaderships, like the way things look is a little bit different. That's not good, or, neither good or bad, just changes. Uh, I think 
towards the end of my time at Baylor is where we started to see the need to protest a little bit more on different issues. Um, I, I would say that has kind of continued, but also the need for it, uh, immediate or urgent need for it hasn't been as prevalent, at least over this past year. Um, but I think that's still something that's pretty common at Baylor is that students are willing to speak up when it's necessary. Um, and for a good reason, I feel like um, it's kind of expected. Of course, it's at Baylor, so it goes to like student activities to get approved and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I would say the biggest changes I've seen um, are almost there's a, a bigger need for students to get, I think, connected to Black Baylor, but also the same need for students to get involved in student government. There's a bigger push on that getting involved in student government, getting involved in student leadership opportunities to make a change um, through those different avenues. So not only to give a place for black students, but also to make a change for black students at Baylor. So that's a big one I've seen, I think, uh, over the past few years, a lot of y'all got involved in student government, uh, which has been a good thing, making changes on that end. Um, but I don't know, I, I feel like Baylor in a lot of, it has changed, but in a lot of ways it's still the same. I think the biggest difference is that uh, the, the y'all aren't the younger ones anymore, but yeah. the younger ones from when I was there, y'all are stepping into different leadership roles on campus yeah. um, and making an impact there. So I think that's good. Yeah. Wait, hold up. What year is it? It's between man. Like I'm just thinking how crazy it is that uh the, now the class of 2024 or like no like the class of 2023. It just can't you like you were working in admissions and now they're coming in. And just to think yeah. about it, it's like, yo, within a couple of years, three years, it'll be 10 years removed since being alumni. And like, you know, yeah. you a lot of stuff about like the 10,000 hours where it was like, um, are you, I, I know this is a really big question, but like, are you where you feel like that you were, you thought you were going to be? Like, you know, especially after post-grad and what does life after post-grad post really look for, you know, college graduate? And now that you've been in the real world for a little bit. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> bro. All right, honestly, if you ask, if you ask any graduates if they are three years out where they thought they would be, and they say, yeah, I'm going to say they're lying. Because <laughs> uh, I feel, I mean, unless you're, like, planning to go to med school or something, it's very rare that you end up where you're planning to be. And I think, for me, I don't really know where I thought I would be. Uh, I definitely thought I would be in grad school, actually. I'll say that. I thought I would have been done with grad school by now and probably working at a university. Now, I have no idea what I want to do in my life. So I'm glad I didn't rush into grad school. Um, so I think the truth is that after you graduate, you almost got to figure out how to do life again. Because uh, college is its own, college is like its own unique thing. Like you're around your friends all the time. Like depending on how you got it set up, you really don't have to worry about like bills, anything like that. You got a nice setup. You go to class, you go home, chill with your friends. Weekend, you ain't got nothing to do. When you graduate, you got to work. You got to make sure you pay your bills. If you have student loans, the student loans sit six months afterwards. Bro, it's like, oh, okay, this ain't this isn't as easy as college. So I think I had that, but I also had kind of the because of where I stayed connected in Waco after I graduated. Yeah, I still kind of functioned like a college student. Yeah, like my lifestyle was still like a college student. Yeah, because uh, I stayed involved at a church in the college ministry. Yeah. So I, I'm doing a out of those transitions now where I'm like, all right, I got to figure out what time I'm supposed to go to sleep. I got to, <clears throat> I can't eat out every day. Like I got to start planning for what's next. You know, uh, another one is if you move to a new city for me, Waco is where I'm at, but like moving to a new city, where do you make friends yep. that are your age? Yes. Like that's one you don't even think about. Like yes. where do you make friends that are your age? You know, cause me, I'm still connected to a lot of college students. I worked in the college ministry. I mean, all of the seniors right now, I knew them when I was on campus and some of the ones that are under them because when I was working at a college ministry, so I'm like, how do I find friends and all that stuff. This is like a lot of stuff to figure out. It's good because your independence is for real when you graduate, like you independent for real, yeah. um, which is good. But, you know, stuff, you talk about this stuff a lot, but like learning how to save, like financing, learning how to build something, all that kind of stuff, like that really hits after college. Some people start early, but a lot of us, it hits like once you graduate. Um, so I would say like the first probably four or five years after you graduate, you still figuring stuff out. Yeah. Like no matter what job you have, a lot of people, 
that I know that I'm friends with, like they started a job, didn't like it. They might be on their like second job now or looking for their second job. So it's like a lot of figuring stuff out. For me, I'm in a good spot because I like where I'm working, yeah. but I also am in a job that I won't, like I know I'm not doing for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the kind of job I have right now, Yeah, I ain't doing this for the rest of my life. So I'm trying to figure out kind of what's next, all that stuff. I don't know, it's, it's good. It's a nice transition. Everybody needs it. Everybody needs that post-grad transition. Yeah. And it's really good. It's also really hard, but I think that's why it's so important because you learn a lot of stuff when life is hard. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I mean, so what were like some of the, uh, the difficult situations? Like, I mean, give like two examples where, you know, you were like, all right, uh, this happened. I'm like, this, I did not, comp I was completely blindsided by that. Cause you know, I'm doing a lot, you know me, I'm pretty adamant on my research and just trying yeah. to speak myself out. I'm like, cause like, I don't want to be in a position where I'm going to be stuck or I feel like I'm yeah. stuck because you just hear a lot about like post-grad depression and, and other things and people like, you know, feeling that. And I don't know, for me and my practices, and I mean, of course my, um, my faith that I subscribe to is Christianity. But I meditate yep. a lot, and I'm really am do my best to learn the art of detachment. Like appreciate everything that I have, but understand yep. where it's going to go, and that helps me process things better. But I wanted to get your understanding, like two experiences that you're like, I did not know how to do this, and how were you able to, I guess, figure yourself, yourself out in terms of finding yeah. your footing? Let's see. I mean, the easiest one is friends. Like figuring out for me how to make friends my age especially in waco because all of my friends graduated and left yeah so i think a big th a big thing that could be kind of hit you out of nowhere <laughs> is when you become a young adult there's really not a separation between a young adult and the 50 year old that works in your office like y'all are all adults so that's where you're like okay they're not seeing me any different so where do i find people in town that are my age luckily where i'm working now a lot of people are my age, so I have made friends through work. But if you are in a, an accounting firm or you're doing accounting for a small business, you might be with a bunch of older people. So you got to figure out where you go in town and make friends. All your friends are all your friends are like moving on in life. So y'all are still close, but they're figuring out the same stuff. They might be another state over or hours away. So you got to figure out how to stay connected to your friends, then how to make new friends. And then on top of that, you're figuring out. <laughs> how to live. Uh, the other big one I think is like planning mm. or what to do when you don't like your job. That's probably another one. Mm. So like you had a plan for what you wanted to do. And it could be that you don't dislike your job. But you're like, oh, my plan isn't really, I think, where I see myself in two years. So I would say like the quarter life crisis really hits when you like, I might've just made that up to be honest, but it really hits when you graduate because you either realize Man, I did. I majored in the right thing. I'm exactly where I want to go, which is good. Or I don't really know if I'm feeling what I'm doing right now, which is still not bad, but you got to figure out what you want to do. So I think that's another one that blindsided me. It's like, I just went to college for four years. I know what I like. I know what I'm passionate about, but I don't know what that lines up with as a job. Yeah. So that's a big one. Now I'm like looking up jobs. What, what are things that I might like to do? Literally, you know how you, when you're in high school, you're Googling like, what should I major in for this? Literally doing the same thing. And what I would say is there's nothing wrong with that. Like as long as you're working hard, as long as you're somewhere working, no matter what that looks like, like figure out, take time, figure out what you want to do. Cause for me, I'm still doing that. Uh, and I don't, I personally don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, bro, I mean, maybe I really don't like how people saw how some people rush that, uh, um, Sometimes, you know, things happen in your life for a reason and timing is really everything for you. Because um, I really have like this conflict with my auntie and she's like, what is the right time? You know, like, OK, so, yeah, you know, things take time, but you think you should have a house by this age or that age. I'm like, who told you that? He's like, yeah, that's like the thing that I would like to do. I'm like, OK, that's what you want to do, but not what I want to do. And maybe like, hey, yes, of course, I'm going to own like that's without a doubt. I want to own property. Will it happen yeah. at the same age as she does? No, because my life is completely different. Everybody's life exactly. is different. But exactly. so that's why I'm like, I really try to do my best not to write a lot of things off, whether that's friendships, because, hey, I may not see eye to eye with this person right now, 
But 20, 20 years down the line, they might call me like, yo, I got a business deal. Or, hey, yo, you want to collaborate on this thing? Like, just exactly. that idea of long-term planning. Um, this is a question that I want to ask you. Is like, how was your mindset able to change when you came in as an 18-year-old to now <laughs> as a, I guess, like a, an adult? It's so weird, like an adult. <laughs> yeah. Because like, you know, I don't I mean, an adult. Yeah, no, it's... I, there's a lot to go that has gone into that. Like my faith, obviously, like growing and like my relationship with God, but then even figuring out like, what does that look like? Like that's been a big part of my life since 18. Um, and even mo like, I think majority of that has been over the past year. But, like what is it like for me personally, Jamarcus to be a Christian and to like go through life and how does that influence all the stuff that I do? that's been a big part of it I think uh and it helped me see the world different I think obviously like my experience as a black man like that has shaped a lot of the world as a know like that shapes a lot of how I interact with people that shapes a lot of the conversations I have like I think personally I'm somebody that's like always trying to build relationships with people that are different from me but also like I'm big <clears throat> about empowering black people especially black men so I'm always connected to a younger black male, whether it's a high school or whether it's a college student. And I'm trying to figure out how do you, how can I help them help themselves? Like, I don't want to do anything for them, but how do I help them see like, you can do whatever you put your mind to, even if the world tells you you can't. Uh, and I think that shaped, for me, college shaped a lot of how I view the world now and how I do that, like why I do that. Um, I think even just like, my experiences in college feeling like people in some settings didn't see me or I had to work. You know, we always hear the phrase, like as black people, like you got to work twice as hard. <laughs> like I think me hearing that and then seeing that has shaped a lot of my mindset now. Like you shouldn't have to work twice. Unfortunately, I think that is true, but we shouldn't have to work twice as hard. Yeah. And so <clears throat> because of that, I want to, I want to help people to see one. I want to help my non-black friends to see you're putting it on us that we need to work twice as hard because if i just do me then you don't see me yeah and i want to put i want to help my myself and other black people around me see like hey do you to the best ability don't worry about trying to be double yourself for somebody else like do you to the best of your ability and make the people around you see you whether it's through a conversation whether it's through speaking up for yourself even if you know even if you're nervous to do it, whatever. Most of us are not nervous to do it, but whatever it might be, you know. Uh, so I would say, yeah, going to Baylor, uh, being black, my experience as a Christian, and being a part of a majority white church, being black, all of that has shaped who I am today, like helped form my mindset, uh, the climate of our country, like, and the conversations that come from that have shaped a lot of my mindset. Um, I think just life in general, like the things you go through in life, whether it's big or small, you won't realize it at the time. Like when you get thrown into a situation as an adult, as an adult, when you get thrown into a situation, you're like, oh man, that conversation I had when I was a freshman in college and was disagreeing with somebody, like that shaped how I view this. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm able to say it at work. That's why for me, the time I had to speak up as a CL, about why we need other black CLs has shaped <clears throat> how you the need for diversity in the work setting or at Baylor. So I can bring that into the conversation at work, you know, different stuff like that. Yeah, so right. I don't know. I feel like life in general, like you don't realize it, <clears throat> but everything you go through in life shapes kind of your, your mindset, how you think about stuff, how you view the world. Um, and for me, my faith, probably I'll say my faith and me being a black male, in majority white settings for most of college have shaped my mindset a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, it, no, I want to definitely dive deeper into that. But before that, I go into that, because like my, my, my first initial question was, all right, you know, you and I, we went to the same church and, you know, we navigated that space. Um, but like, I want to go like dive deeper into like more of your, your childhood. When did you realize, yeah. what was the thing when you realized that moment where you realized, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm black? Like, I, I 
I, I'm, it's yeah. so we're like, when did you realize, like, yeah, I'm, I'm black, and uh, I can't unsee yeah. it. <laughs> Bro, I mean, it's interesting because I, I'm from College Station. It's like, I would say College Station is very similar to Baylor. Like, the demographic of College Station is very similar to Baylor. Like, it's majority white. There are black people, but there's not that many of us. We all know each other for the most part. Most black people in college, the college station area live in Bryant, and that's where my family's from. So mm-hmm. around my family, I mean, we were all really only around black people, except for like my mom's best friends. They're both, two of them are white. So like they were around us, but they came and hung around black people. Um, but I went to a school and the nicest school in our district for elementary school, and I would get in trouble all the time. Like I never, if, I never got in trouble in school except for elementary school. I got in trouble all the time. Uh, and I remember, like, they would, they were like, maybe he has ADHD. I, you know, like, you're a kid. You don't really know what they're talking about. But I remember those conversations. And I remember my mom being like, no, you don't have ADHD. Like, they're saying, like, she was basically saying, I remember her saying, like, they're going to stop picking on U.S. school. Like, that kind of thing. And I used to, I, kid, I was, like, trying to defend, like, oh, no, they're not picking on me at school. But that's, I think, when I really realized at school for the first time is when I realized Okay, I get treated a little bit different, and I don't know why. And then, and this is funny, bro. This is actually really funny. Third grade, I think it was third grade, there was a girl in my class, and her parents would pack her, like, you know, pack her a little lunch, and they put, like, the chewy bars, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and my lunch, you know, my mom would give me some cookies or something. It wasn't even my lunch. You know, I just get some cookies from the cabinet, put them in a bag, bring them to school. So during lunch or snack time, we would switch. So I would get her like chewy bar and she would get my cookies. Yeah. And I, I can't remember when, but I, we did that for a while. And at some point, I remember we got ready to switch and my teacher came over and was like, you might want to not switch with her today. Her parents are in the office um, saying that you've been stealing her snack. Like I remember, I remember the teacher telling me like, oh, like they said you've been stealing her, her snack. And I think for me, that was the time I realized like, hold up, something ain't right here. Whoa. So I get, I mean, up until like, from the time I entered that school in kindergarten until I left in fourth grade, they were always like, he has ADHD, something. I had all A's, like, bro, all A's. <laughs> he has ADHD, he has something, da da da. So I remember in third grade, bro, she, her mama said I was still in her snack. She, I don't know if she got scared and she just, like, her mom was like, why, like, if she had my container, you know, that the cookies were in or whatever, like, why do you have this container? She didn't bring her container back with her carrots in it. And yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. So <laughs> that was- about eight, like you know, you were eight years old, and just like thinking about like how you know we grow up in psychology and how that that's that, honestly that's low key trauma when you really yeah. talk about it because like see how that experience in itself like we remember something that when we we're eight years old when I was doing my neuro yeah. research and my psychology research and understanding how some of like some experiences or even experiences like maybe like and the, the phenomenon when like as a black person when you're driving on the road and then we see the yeah. you, you you have you start having a response and right. sit up straight yeah and it's just that experience has literally changed each and everything like oh it's different because I'm now accused of stealing for him snacks from my teacher yeah yeah yeah, bro. Like the fact that I I still remember that, and I remember like they never said it's because you're black, but I think that was where it's like this added, it added up for me. Like why I was like, why is it always something at the school? Like there's it's always something. I mean, I was always maybe one of two or three black kids in my class, um, especially when you know you get to like GT. Yeah. Then I was like the only black kid in my class. There's already like only so many of us. Then I went to, <laughs> to the GT classes, or whatever. And that's when I was like, okay, what is the, what could be the possible reason? And that, that's where I started to realize and I started thinking about like all the stuff my mom was saying. And I was like, yeah, like I'm different than the rest of my classmates. Mm-mm-mm. That's not right, man. And so now when you're growing up with that and uh, <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm laughing <laughs> now, but I'm just thinking about like, um, now what, what you did work in ministry for a while. And um, you were a prominent figure. I remember the, the very first day um, I went to Lion Camp and I was talking to this guy who happened to be Dennis. 
And um, then it's this big guy, and he said, man, I can't wait for you to meet you, Marcus. You know, we're going to play basketball and whatever. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Um, but you were heavily involved in he told, he told you to play basketball? Well, not told me to play basketball, but, like, you know, there's this, I know this guy named Jamarcus oh, okay. plays basketball. Um, he's a good guy, Christian. He goes to Antioch. And, and, like, you know, kind of that recruitment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many people are going to watch this because I'm <laughs> – but I don't, I'm not going to say anything further than that. But, <laughs> but um, you know, it's like, yeah, man, come, come. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> – <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh man. So sometimes, why do you think it's important for why do you think it was important, like, um, for you to have worked in ministry as a black man? Because you know, see, the thing is with a lot of um, within, like, I guess religion, but I know a common theme that I've been seeing is whenever, like, in the African American or the African community, it is usually the woman that's a pioneer of the faith. And yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say, like, see, the thing is biblically it's supposed to be the oh the man is but honestly biblically it's supposed to be one union equally yoked but you know you notice like there's this lapse of lack of male leader black male leadership within the church or ministry that are really changing because yeah. of, you know, that, stigma and that notion of oh man I'm, uh, I'm not a thug but like oh you know i don't need god you know i got it on my own because i'm like you know i got it it's me it's you know i'm good i don't need god and uh um, yeah. You know, I remember we always used to throw, uh, I don't know, freshman year, not us, but I know I went to life group and they used always used to throw around the word mog or uh, like man of God or a wog. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, no, no. no. <laughs> but um, being, a, being a black man of God, especially when, you know, sometimes in life or in the media specifically when we're watching stuff, you don't necessarily see that. I was not necessarily yeah. really exposed to the only, like, I mean, of course, I went to, um, I'm, since I'm living in Mansfield, but I'm very close to the Potter's house, which is 20, uh, 20 minutes away. You only see, like, these bushes or these older men. But now, of yeah. course, you will know, have that revelation and that revolution of younger men, like Jerry Lorenzo, the designers, or Mike Todd's, and um, O, and all this, like, this new wave of, like, men that are advocating. Yeah. There was a, a, a lack of that. And, um, are you what like ex explain your experience like being that guy like a being a pillar um for 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 yourself and also other black males and females and uh yeah about, like the responsibility and also like the weight and understanding that man this is a lot yeah bro i mean i agree 100 with just with what you're saying and i would even say like there still is really a lack of uh young black men that are like lead, that are leading in ministry to be honest um I think there's a lot that plays into it. I'll like I'll start with myself personally. I think for me, like it, it 100 percent was just how God like kind of shaped my shaped my my college experience and how that panned out. But my freshman year, I did the same thing I did in high school. I mean, I've always been like a good kid. Uh, I don't even like using that phrase for a kid back here. Uh, but I mean, I didn't really do much freshman year um but i realized like man my life is exactly the same now as it was in high school you know I, everybody always talks about college being a change uh so when i came back sophomore year I, a big thing for me is like, i want to grow in my faith and i didn't know what that looked like <clears throat> but i saw people around me that went to uh antioch and it looked different <clears throat> i can't really say what about it looked different and so i started going there um, and I think for me, that's where it really, I realized two things. One, like I can't fake anything. Like I, that's one thing I realized very quickly. I cannot fake anything. So I think at first, first I was trying to do, I was trying to model my faith after, like after people around me, uh, <laughs> which we hear that a lot in our culture, like find somebody you want to be like and shape your life after them. But the reality is like, especially for Christians, like just read the Bible for yourself listen to your favorite pastor, you know, uh, on, on a podcast, on a YouTube video, watch the sermon series, listen to the pastor at your home church, wherever, wherever you're going to get fed, listen to, listen to your mentor. But at the end of the day, like we have to be reading the Bible for ourselves. Like we have to read 
books that help us put the Bible in context, help us come to our own understanding of who God is and how <clears throat> that's reflected in us. Um, and I think for me, I realized that that was something I slowly realized more and more uh, over my time in college. Um, and I realized how easy it was for people to come in and just model themselves after people around them. But at the same time, I realized how hard it was for black people to try to do that. If they're, especially in the context of where I was, um, yeah. because like, yeah, like myself, I think a lot of black people, like we just have a heart. We can't really fake it. Like there's not a lot of room for being fake or faking something in our personality. That's not real or that's not us. And that's not saying that the people around me were faking it. I'm, for me, I just, my culture was different than theirs. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, a big thing, a big part of it is I felt like I want to keep growing my faith. I want to keep learning more of who God is, who God is in me, what that looks like and how I live my life. And I want other people, not just black, but that people that might be having a hard time trying to do it, um, like, other, like the people they're seeing, to have a space to do the same. So. Uh, that was really where it started for me. Um, I didn't, I mean, I still don't see myself as like a spiritual leader. I didn't set out to be a spiritual leader. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give a space for myself selfishly, but then also other young black men, especially. Um, and it turned out to be a space where, I mean, there were black men, black women, Hispanic, Asian, whoever needed a space where they could just come and be themselves, but still grow in their faith. That's what I wanted to do, create a space for them um, by getting real, by hearing, hearing about what's going on in their lives, like hearing about what's hard, hearing about what questions they have, and me not being almost telling them the same thing I'm telling you now, like, hey, like, I don't know the answer, but we can look at this Bible together and figure it out. Also, when you come to me with something, that's something that's big for me, like, I'm not, I'm, I can't judge you because I have mistakes. I'm simple myself. Like, I've made mistakes in life, so I can't judge you based off of that. So come to me. If you want to come to me, come to me. Be real. If you want to come to somebody, come to somebody and be real. But together, go to the Bible. You figure out how you should respond to that based off what the Bible says, based off who God is. I think for me, that was a big part of my own um, path towards ministry. It's just, I feel like <clears throat> the Bible is very clear. Like, love God, love your neighbor. For me, the way I was, I felt called to love my neighbor was to create a space for my neighbors to grow in their faith like I wanted to. Yeah. Mine. Uh, and I think that's important for black males because I think we can reach each other uh, in ways that other people might not be able to. I think that's why there's such a need for black men in ministry. Like, <clears throat> I can't speak to all black men because we're all different. <laughs> but there is a group of black men that I can speak to that maybe my white counterpart or Asian counterpart can't. Um, and I think the more that we break down the stereotypes that America has put on us as black men, the more we can actually be ourselves, be who God's called us to be, um, and see more black men in different positions, leadership, which I think there are a lot of black men already in leadership, but we don't always get to see it um, <clears throat> because America has a picture of us that is painted in media, painted in movies. Um, and so, I don't know, I think also there are a lot of black men that are doing great things in churches, that are doing great things uh, in ministry, but a lot of times they don't get the opportunity uh, to serve in a leadership position or they don't get the opportunity to be the person on stage uh, for whatever reason. Uh, some people <laughs> just need to look at themselves and see why they aren't why they're overlooking the black person next to them. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's a need. I think that uh, we have, there's a lot of strength and power in us as black people, black men, black women. Um, I think that when we step into who God has called us to be, especially those of us that feel like God has called us to be in ministry, like there is a, a lot of power and he can do a lot through us. So uh, I feel like for anybody that's listening, like if you're black and you feel a call to ministry, like, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be something really big. For me, like I said, I still don't see myself <laughs> as a spiritual leader. Yeah. Um, and I don't feel like what, I, what I've what i done and what I do now is really big. I just feel like uh, I did what I needed and it happened to be what other people needed and it's made a space for people to grow and 
for me to have genuine relationships with people where we can talk about God and who he made us to be. So, yeah, that I mean, I can talk about that for a while, but <clears throat> I think if you feel called, anybody that's listening to mentor, be a spiritual leader, go into ministry, do it. Like, you don't have to be perfect. God is the one that's going to lead and take people where they need to go. So take the risk. Yeah, that's good. That's that's really, really good, especially with that. So now, like, the thing is, you, um, we were, the last time we were talking during, um, it was, what day was that? Um, when all those kids decided to come to Baylor and you were in the, <laughs> in the, in the Sikkim laundry. What day? I forgot the day. Um, uh, uh, was that premiere? I don't think, uh, was it premiere? I think it was Premiere or no? It was premiere. It was premiere. Okay, it was premiere. Yeah, it was. But then, wait, what, did we have? Is premiere in the fall? It was against yeah. TCU. Yeah, against TCU. Yeah, when everybody. Yeah, we have, we have two premieres. Yeah, okay. it, was, it was in the fall. Man, I'm surprised I'm not fired yet. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna tell nobody, bro. I'm not gonna tell on you. <laughs> um, but um, you know, you were talking about you know, um, if you were to go back to grad school and you said you were to go to university, you would want to teach a curriculum of African American African studies. And that is something that has definitely been underrated um, and not really taught unless you go to an HBCU. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's just a lot of um, systematic um, oppression and discrimination when it comes to teaching such a curriculum or knowing the history. Because I mean, um, this a uh, I don't I don't like saying the, the system, but like the things that were the structure that was in place and the people and the leadership that came during the past that has limited the understanding of. Um, the African diaspora um, was very. Yeah. What was like your first exposure for you of learning, like you know, African American studies, and you, you know, more? Uh, yeah, no, pro black. You like more like more yeah. for yourself and understanding that hey, I'm grateful to be black and I want to continue to empower my people. And why do you think? Yeah. Uh, I think two things. One. Uh, Going to Baylor, going to a PWI, uh, you're forced into situations, I think, uh, especially as a minority, where you either uh, fully embrace who you are or you succumb to the <laughs> majority culture, whatever that is around you. Um, I think for me at Baylor, um, something I'll say is like, there's a lot of layers to us. And I think a lot of us know how to survive, you know, in whatever setting that's. I think, I mean, history has made black people very resilient. So we know how to survive in a lot of settings. And in the same sense, I think we can, uh, you know, put up what we're thinking on pause to sit through a class and be the only black person. Um, but at some point you become tired of that. Um, I think for me in college, there was an experience as a CL where there was a conversation happening about black people and I was sitting there and they didn't, I don't know if they didn't realize I was sitting there or for some reason they didn't associate me with the black people they were talking about. Uh, but in that moment, I had a decision to make whether or not I spoke up or I didn't say anything. Um, and I obviously chose to speak up uh, um, and address like, I mean, put it simply, I said, hey, I'm one of those, I'm one of them. You know, they were saying them. Um, I'm one of them. And it was in regards to a protest that happened on campus. Uh, it was during, I think, 2014, maybe 2014 or 2015. It was when, after Mike Brown was shot. Yeah. Um, and so I think for me personally, everybody has like a, I think a moment um, where you have to fight for yourself. You know, you have to fight for your history. You have to fight to be seen. Uh, I think that's a common thing in America for black people. You have to say, "Hey, I'm in. I'm in the room. Like, hey, this is my experience, and it matters." And I think for me, I had that experience uh, at CL. I my first year. I was a commuter at Baylor, which is like an RA, um, and I noticed very quickly when I became a community leader, there weren't a lot of Black community leaders. Um, and so, for me, a big thing during that time was if there's a Black male in my residence hall or that I meet that would be a good CL. I'm gonna make sure that I do everything I can to help them get there, if that's something they wanna do. Um, and I think it was little things like that for me, like representation, like 
I didn't have any black professors. I, I thought about a lot of that stuff. And I always have since I was in high school. Um, you know, I've always been the person to have, I've been friends with everybody. And I've always been the person to have a conversation of, about why affirmative action is important, about why um, I have a problem with people asking me if I'm going to college to play sports. Those kind of conversations started young because I went to a school that um, was similar to Baylor. It, there was a lot of white people. So I think for me, um, I've kind of picked up on that at an early age. I think um, those conversations hi further highlight why there's a need for African history to be taught, African-American history to be taught um, on university campuses. And I would even say um, in high school, grade school uh, curriculum, <laughs> because I think that as black people, even us, like if we want to learn about our history, we have to do further research. We have to do a lot of digging. So that's a disrespect to us, like a disservice to black people that we don't get to hear our history. Um, in class and that the history we do here uh, is a result of our ancestors being slaves. Um, yeah. And that part is brushed over. Uh, and so I think for us personally, it's a disrespect to us that we don't get to hear our history, uh, but we get to hear about the history that exists because of the work of our ancestors um, and a sacrifice of our ancestors. And the <laughs> this humanity, wait, what's the word I'm trying for? Because of um, America's history of making us less than, like that is why we have a lot of things that we do have, and we talk about a lot of things that we do talk about in American history. Um, and so, in the same sense, we need to acknowledge the mistreatment of African Americans in America. One, <laughs> and we need to highlight the African Americans that have done great things um, in America in our history classes. Uh, because they are overlooked, they aren't talked about, and we as African Americans need people that look like us to be proud of um, outside of the people that we find on our own, because as we all know, we all have family, we all have African Americans that we grow up around, Africans that we grow up around that are doing, they they on their stuff, they're making us proud. Uh, they're role models that we can look up to, but our white classmates need to see that too. Um, and so I think yeah, it's a disservice to us that we aren't getting it. And I think on the other side, our white classmates need to see why we get upset when things happen. They need to see why we're still not happy. They need to see why we say America's still racist. They need to understand why we say that American, that American society is still uh, unjust. They need to understand why we say the system is messed up. And the only reason that they don't see why it's because they're not aware and some of them choose not to see why that's not the only reason take that back some of them choose to ignore it they are they have been talked to whatever um but i don't know i think like if they hear our history now there's no excuse like you've <laughs> you've heard our history you know um and they should i think whether or not the class is taught everyone should have a desire to know american history the real of american history so yeah. Uh, all that said, I think that it needs to be taught. I think that it needs to be an option for every student. Yeah, most definitely, because um, I didn't know until last summer, um, the first African-American billionaire was Reginald Lewis. He was a lawyer, um, also was a patent for uh, Heinz Ketchup. Um, mm -hmm. it just, it, it, there's just like, there's Michael V. Roberts. Uh, you got Oprah Winfrey, of course. Uh, you just got... Uh, uh, you know, all these actresses and actors and Madam C.J. Walker and, um, and yeah. all these great, and like the, the first person to invent the, the potato on lower were black and uh, ice cream black. Um, you have yeah. all yeah. these inventions and all these discoveries, um, even to an extent where you can say that um, a huge contribution of the modern internet um, were Nigerians. And so nobody yeah. else, like um, giving the credit that is due. And I mean, honestly, it, yeah. I, I don't think, you know, yeah, sometimes, of course, you know, we want to be credited, like there's validation. It's not even about the credit. It's just about the respect. Well, respect and getting us away from like- We need to be credited. We do need to be credited, yeah. But like, it's rather than being treated like a second class citizen, like, hey, let's be treated as equal because I don't care what anybody says. Like people still, people of color are second class uh, citizens. And the one thing, oh, yeah. the one thing that I 
um, have been coming more aware about um, and uh, always been interested about is especially um, African Americans and Africans and LGBTQ plus. Um, mm. And you know, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of hard, uh, not hard, but you know, of course, with Christianity or what the way that the Bible was presented and shown and manipulated in the modern America. I'm just yeah. gonna no, people got it. You got to hey, research and think for yourself. Sorry, not sorry. Um, you have yeah. like doctrine, and sometimes so, like even sometimes when we say okay, Black Lives Matter. Are we considering all black lives or all the, like, just the black lives that are just, are comfortable for us? And when mm-hmm. you think that the black trans community and the black um, homosexual community, they have, they don't have a life expectancy to 34, anywhere from 34 years. Uh, well, trans is, max is like 34 on average. Gay mm-hmm. um, is about, what, 45, 50. Uh, but even then, it's, it, it, it's frustrating because you know, how are we able to create a community when we're saying, like, advocating for all of them when even sometimes, like, oh, now nah, there's so much, like, this divisiveness. And how do you yeah. navigate and how are you able to um, possibly uh, continue to advocate for things that you don't necessarily support or, like, or agree with on a uh, theological level, but also continues yeah. to say, hey, it doesn't matter where you want people when we're young unity. And because those people and those groups' rights, they have their rights, but, like, but how come we're not really able to really feel or feel like we have those liberties? Yeah. So two, I'll answer this in two parts. One, um, I mean, as a black person, I'll say this until the day that I die. We have to fight for each other. We got to stand for each other. I don't care if we disagree on everything about life. If you're black, I'm fighting for you because we all go through the same struggle. And some of us have added struggles on top of that, depending on um, <laughs> you know, our socioeconomic class, depending on our access to different things that different necessities that some of us might have and some of us might not, depending on our sexual orientation, all those things. So even for me, if I don't agree with you or like on on something or how you live your life, you're black. Um, And so I think that as a community, we have to come together. I think especially us young people, we get to kind of be the start of that. We have to stick together. We have to ride for each other, especially given the state of our nation right now. if we aren't sticking for each other, if we aren't sticking up for each other, if we aren't sticking up for ourselves, then who's winning? Um, so I think that's a big thing that I'm gonna say until the day that I die. Uh, we have to stop fighting each other. We have to stop killing each other. America's doing that for us. Like we don't need to be killing each other. Absolutely. We have to be standing up for each other. And I think on the other end, as a Christian, the this is I don't know why this is such a hard concept, but regardless of what I think about how somebody lives their life, my call and the commandment that God has given me is to love them. Absolutely. And so I'm never going to treat anybody different because of how they live their life, because of their sexual orientation, because of how they sin. I sin <laughs> just like everybody else. I can't treat anybody different because of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, what I can do is, is love them. What I can do as a fellow black person is stand up for what is wrong and if they're be, being treated wrong, regardless of any of those things, it's wrong. Yeah. Um, um, and so I can speak up on their behalf. I can put aside my personal, our personal disagreement to speak up. Um, and I, I especially feel the need to say that in regards to the church. We can't pick and choose what sin is okay. We can't pick and choose which sin we speak out against. And I think that has happened so much throughout uh, um, Christianity, especially in America, like we pick and choose what sin is okay and what sin isn't. It's all sin. Mm-hmm. Like regardless of the topic and with whether or not you choose to see it as sin, like whatever. That, regardless, we can't choose, pick and choose who we speak out against. At the end of the day, we're called to love. And none of us change each other. Like I can't change you. The only person that can change us is God. So I can't, I can't put it on myself to change somebody's mindset on anything um and the even the thought that we wouldn't stand up for our fellow brother or sister because of their sexual orientation or identity that baffles me like we just we've lost throughout history so many black people whether to death or to the prison system we've lost so many black people i don't want to lose anybody that we don't have to and so for me i'm gonna fight stand up for 
whoever I have to, however that looks. Um, like I said, put aside my disagreements. If I really disagree with how they live their life, if I really disagree with how somebody lives their life, my call as a Christian is to pray for them and hope that they pray for me too, if they're a Christian, because I need the prayer just as much. Not to be hateful towards them or to be the judge. I'm not the judge. Mm. So if we can all get that, this is one black community we got to stick together. Two, for everybody, especially Christians, stop judging each other. Like we have to stop judging each other. Absolutely. And it's so funny because um, just with that, um, I was watching a video of uh, a prominent Christian pastor and um, minister Lou, uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan and how they were saying like, I'm, and he was saying, I'm Muslim and I'm Christian and we're one, you know, we're all one, like in the eyes of God, like we might call them different or whatever, but we know that where we come from and we have to continue to advocate and fight for our people. Um, so that's why, I mean, <clears throat> I'm always listening to a lot of different um, thought leaders and speakers and from Farrakhan to Todd, Mike Todd, and just like all, all just from, every spectrum because i've been like i have such a diverse plate in well an ever-growing diversity uh, diversity of thought plate because i know it's always mm -hmm. very important to have perspectives give and take see what's true to try to determine myself because if i'm not exposed yeah. then i have an opinion right but like you see how with each and everything like um each and every um other ethnicity they were able to establish generational wealth because they have group, uh, they have practiced group, uh, group economics. But it's so crazy because we can't say, uh, we, uh, you and I cannot point here and say like, oh man, like, you know, why aren't we passing, why aren't we practicing group economics when, yeah. that, when we did and that has been <laughs> tarnished in Tulsa, yeah. Oklahoma? <laughs> and, and yeah. Like, yeah. Just the, the, that in itself, or like when each and every community had tried to step up and try to go for themselves. And after that, it was yeah. like, MLK was not MLK did not die because he had a dream. He died because he started talking about economic freedom, and like right after that, and he even said that maybe integration was a mistake because after integration, all these black businesses and everything um, started to die off, and then you know you have other communities that always understand like okay, we gotta we're gonna work together, but it's not like it, it's honestly kind of not our fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I I mean, first of all, let's be real. We had a 300-year back set. That's just slavery. That's not, a, that's not even including the civil rights movement. So we're, we're, we're way behind in, in the even opportunity to build up generational wealth. Also, 300 years of being told your lesson in by not only people, but by the laws of a country, plus a hundred years of fighting to prove that you're not, there's a mindset that even we have to come out of as a people, you know? And <clears throat> as you started to see people come out of that mindset, it was quickly torn down. It was quickly tarnished. And so I think, I don't know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, I mean, I loved you. You had an episode with Jocelyn, and I love what she talked about the equity versus equality. Absolutely. Um, of, I mean, we hear all the time in America that, oh, it's equal. You know, we all have equal access to the American dream. What? First of all, I don't, I don't even think that's true. I don't even think that's true. So I, I'll get on that topic a little bit later. But equality doesn't put us all at the same place because of our history. Mm -hmm. One. Two, even a more equitable system doesn't put us all in the same place. It takes years. I mean, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. My siblings are going to college. I may have a little bit more money than my parents. Maybe I might not. You never know. That's still not going to be enough to, you know, I don't know. Who Only God knows. That still might not be enough to start the generational wealth that's gonna sustain my family for the long haul. It's gonna take years for us to start catching up to that. And so I think it's, it's hard, but I think also there's a lot of opportunity because, I mean, we, we some smart people, we're smart, innovative people. Literally the sky is the limit for us. I mean, we built the and pyramids. Uh, literally, <laughs> the sky is the limit. Yeah, like, throughout history. 
we have been, we, I mean, I always say this, like all the places that people are paying money to go see, a black person built them. A black person thought of it. So if we, I think even now, like putting it into the minds of youth, putting it into the minds of high schoolers, putting it into the minds of elementary school kids, dream big. Like I love sports. I love watching sports. I obviously sports enhance college experience and I'm proud of all of our college athletes, but I also want us to be boxed in by sports. Mm. And I want kids to have the opportunity to dream outside of sports. I feel like sports is a, another, or is becoming another foothold on our community. Now all of our kids are focused on being entertainment for <laughs> their community. They're focused on being the best athlete they can be. And they're not even given the opportunity to enhance their mind if they want to. If you think, I mean, they want to take an AP class. Oh, well, that might interfere with travel from sports. Some schools have the flexibility to do it. I mean, <laughs> some schools allow, some colleges allow athletes to major in whatever they want. Most athletes can't major in something really hard because it doesn't match up with their practice schedule, you know, or the, kind of the opportunity they need outside that might not match up. I, there's a lot that goes into that. Yep. But I want, I want young black kids to be able to dream that they can be a doctor. I want them to dream that they can start the next Facebook. Like if, cause if they dream it and they start setting goals to get there, if we see, uh, if we see a black kid dream to be a teacher, now that black teacher can help another black kid dream to be a doctor. Now that black doctor can help the next black kid in med school dream to be a surgeon. Like we can empower each other. Sadly, it might take a while, but for those of us that have, whether, I mean, regardless of our education level, regardless of where we are, like, that have accomplished, could we all have accomplished something in life? So that's yeah. this is me saying all of us. For those of us that have accomplished whatever goals we set forth, like, let's empower the young people around us. Let's empower our friends to set a goal and accomplish that and to dream big. Like, we don't have to box ourselves in. Yeah. And when we get there, bring another black person up with you. Like, that's, <laughs> that's the piece, I think. Like, once you get there, bring another black person up with you. And I love, like, seeing people that are supporting black businesses you know that's something i personally want to get more into and i'm saying this for myself too like i want to get more into that. like if a black person around me has worked hard to start a business however i can support i need to start figuring out how to do that yeah. like, however i can support i want to do it yeah um so I, I think like i said the sky's the limit i think we can do a lot um i think unfortunately we've had we've been set back quite a bit so there needs to be some systematic change as well uh, from a government level, uh, from an educational level, from a financial level um, to bring more equity. Uh, I like what Shoslin said, to bring more liberation. There, there needs to be some work done in the system on that end. Um, but I think also like we as a people, um, we can do whatever we put our minds to. And, um, I, I dream for a day where we don't have to convince people that we can do whatever we put our minds to. Absolutely. And with that, I mean, you know, it's so funny because we know we have all this, but what's your, what, what's your, what are your thoughts when, when you got culture <laughs> vultures that just what they want, they want, every, they want everything. Like I remember here in my life, man, I wish I was black. Oh, how does it feel to be black? Oh man, you guys have tall. You guys are tall. You guys are strong. Oh, you guys are naturally cut. Oh man, I wish I was black. And then after that, I remember in grade school, I even all the way from grade school all the way to um, high school. Tanaka, you're not black. You sound so white. You sound you're so well spoken. Like, no, nah, you're not. You're not. <laughs> you're, you're white. I, I, I don't know what what is your what are your thoughts around like those comments and um and also like people um in entertainment or anything that try so hard to be black um women taking plastic surgery getting lips botox all that stuff to look black to get this this physique um or or just like these thoughts and ideas and these songs and or yeah. like, prime example um um elvis presley and chuck berry uh, <laughs> or all of these yeah. ideas being stolen and being like oh hey yeah, yeah. 
bro. <laughs> Uh, that's a, that's a big one. First of all, there is no white way or black way of speaking. Yes, there's dialect. Yes, we all have, uh, what is it? Euphonetics? Is that what it's called? What is it called? Yeah. Yeah. What is it called? Wait, you mean, mean uh, Ebonics? Euphonics. Euphonics. I was like Euphonics. Euphonics or Eubonics? Eubonics, bro. Eubonics. <laughs> yeah. Like, we, there are different ways that people talk based off how they grow, they grow up, where they grow up. Yeah, I don't know. But, uh, that, we'll cut that part. <laughs> but what I want to say is the stereotype thing has such a big influence on American society. And there are very few races that have as many negative stereotypes placed on them by culture, by media, by Hollywood as the black community. And I think what's true about stereotypes is the more we hear them, the more we see them, the more we become them. And that, that's just, I think, the way our minds work. What you see on TV, what you listen, everybody say what, say, says program, what you listen to. I'm trying to program your mind, sorry, not sorry. Exactly, exactly. And so I think when it comes to that, the comment of like, you talk like a white guy, or you hang out with white people, you're not black. At the end of the day, if, if your heritage started in Africa, because all of us, regardless of who you are, we all, if we got, you got the darkest skin, we started in Africa, you black, you're black. Nobody can take that from you. This goes back to what I said earlier. We have to stick together. So especially in the black community, we have to stop saying that kind of stuff to each other. I, something one of the most disheartening things for me is seeing black people who reject their own culture because they because they feel pushed away. Yeah. We can't push each other away because we all have the same history. And this is gonna go to that part of people saying they want to be black. First of all, I thank God every day that I'm black. I would not want to be any other race because I said like I said earlier, like I know that my heritage even though American, America tried to make it something that's negative, yeah. is one of resiliency. Like, I know that I can overcome anything because I am black, because my ancestors overcame what it might be the worst thing ever. Like, literally beaten, literally told your animal, literally made a, a slave to people, and they overcame it. And I graduated from college and we're able to sit here and talk about how powerful we are as a race. So I'm going to say that first. Sorry to any white person that gets plastic surgery, that tries to sell our music, that says you wish you were black. You can't be. I'm sorry. And I don't care what you say. I don't care what you do. I don't care how hard you try. You'll never be black. You say you'll never be I don't like <laughs> culture vultures. I do like people genuinely trying to understand someone else's culture. You don't have to become someone else's culture to understand it though. And so I think there's a fine line between that. I think that as a community, again, we have to realize that as black people, we are diverse. We all speak differently. We all have grammatical errors, errors and everything we say. We all have different tones to our voice that does not make our, our speaking white or black. And that messes with the mind when people say stuff like that. So, and I think another thing is there is some hidden message behind everything that people say. When somebody says, because you speak intellectually that you sound white, that's insinuating that only white people sound so when someone asked me when I was coming in Bay, when I was playing football, they probably weren't thinking this, so they might have been. But in my mind, was you think every black person here, every black guy here is going to play sport. There's something, there's a message behind everything that we say. So two things. One, stop and think before you say it. Two, if you do say something wrong and somebody calls you out on it, don't get defensive. Figure out why you think that. It might be because of the movies you watch. 
stereotypes. It might be because of the stereotypes that you believe about black people. So as a society, people have to be willing to take, when somebody speaks up, you have to be willing to listen, even if you don't like it, you feel uncomfortable. And I think that, yeah, we can see it in 2020s that most people aren't willing to listen. But another conversation, another conversation. Another conversation. Man, um, I mean, I think this is a, a lot. We had we talked about a lot, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I like this, bro. And I mean, it's so funny, but guys, like, this is the conversation Jam and I have all the time whenever we catch up. So, <laughs> so <laughs> honestly, you know, we don't want to go too deep into the rabbit hole. But um, um, these are my last two questions, bro. Um, no, no, no. I think no. You've actually answered the majority of the ones, but like my last question for you is, uh, what do you want your legacy to be? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, and I'm not just saying this to say it, but I don't really think about legacy. Yeah. Because I don't want to be somebody that thinks about myself too much. Yeah. Um, I can tell you how I want to live my life. Um, but I don't really care to think about what I want my legacy to be because I think that is very me focused and that can lead me down a path that I don't want to go. Um, but I want to live my life in a way that helps people to feel seen. Like I want everybody that knows me to feel like I saw them. Um, not what they did, not what they said, not their mistakes, but I actually saw who they were as a person. I saw what they were struggling with. I saw their potential. I saw who they could be. Um, I saw the hard work behind the scenes. Like I want to be somebody that even if I don't talk to you every day, I'm close enough where I can see behind the scenes. Um, and I want to empower and encourage other people to do that. Uh, I think American society would be so much better if people actually saw each other and saw us. And I know this is, I'm just going to say this because I need to. The America is talking, everybody in America is talking about a mind, our very right now. Some white people that I have been silent for as long as I've known them <laughs> suddenly are talking. And I've said this and I'll say it again. Maud Arbery will happen again unless people start seeing the black men, the black women, the black stories, the black hurt, the black pain, the black struggle around them. Not just your one black friend that you know from Vegas. Not just your one black friend from church, not just your one black friend that you trust, but every black person around you. See them. See the stereotypes you place on them. See your own prejudice. Against them. See your own bias against them. Mm -hmm. There's layers to us, and people miss out on a lot of the richness that we get to see because they have a picture of us, and that's all they see. They don't actually see us. And I don't know, I think that personally, I try to put myself out there and see people who are different from me. Um, and so I hope that what I'm saying, the way I want to live my life, I encourage other people to do the same. That's uh, more than anything. Um, see, and part of that seeing us is seeing who God made us to be. Like, yeah. there's beauty in black culture because God created black culture. He created black people. There's beauty in that. See the beauty in that. I see the beauty in you. Um, yeah. I'll stop there. That's amazing, bro. Yeah, I think you hit it. A lot of them know. Last segment of the show, Speak Life. Uh, this is where I just tell people, uh, what's up? I'm just going to keep it short and simple. I love you so much, big bro. And thank you for your authenticity and always seeing people, man. Uh, that's Appreciate that's, you, bro. that's it. Appreciate it. Hey, this is, keep doing what you're doing. Keep keep going down this path. Keep bringing people on here that are uh, speaking that that truth, <laughs> that are saying what's on their mind. Uh, you got a good thing going. So thank you for having me on here. Even though I feel like we just we're catching up, but I appreciate you having me. <laughs> I, mean, I, show, mean, I mean, hey, they <laughs> catch up. it's all good. You know, they get to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But all right, y'all, that's um that's it for episode two eighteen and we are out.